<laughs> like, I can't believe I'm starting this by laughing, but honestly, yeah, some of these stories since we've announced the hiring of Enzo Maresca, they're going to blow your minds. They're absolutely nuts. They're crazy. And we have a lot to unpack after this announcement of our new head coach. So, my friends, sit back for this one, relax, and let's get through these stories. Now, I think it's best that we start with things by really understanding why Enzo Maresca was hired and his ambitions for this season and he might be a bit blown away because in a meeting with the board when Maresca was asked whether he thinks that this squad is ready to compete for a top four level Maresca simply replied he did not come here to compete for top four he believes this squad right now should be fighting for the Premier League title with the amount of talent in this squad he wants to challenge Man City and Arsenal straight from the bat next season I want pre-season to start tomorrow so we can start training with the squad at his disposal. These are massive claims. These are big claims. And is Enzo Maresca risking showing more than he can swallow right now? Because we also remember last year, Pochettino came with big ambitions, grand plans, fast forward 12 months later. And reality painted a completely different story. Now, is Maresca gassing it because he knew that if he talks a big talk because he felt like this would be the best strategy to get hired because we're getting further context that Igbali was really moved by Enzo Maresca as we know Winston Lee Stewart they went to Marbella to essentially have this meeting with Maresca tie things down but Maresca also spoke to Igbali on the phone and revealed his ambitions towards him and Igbali liked what he heard Igbali was impressed by how knowledgeable he was of the club and all the players across multiple different age groups. He liked the ambition that was being shown. And one thing with Igbali is, if you move him, he'll get you. And maybe, on a separate note, he doesn't get enough credit for just how astute he is business-wise because, yet again, why is Igbali being reported being the one who's tirelessly doing the work to get this deal completed. Now, I guess it makes sense, of course, we had to find an agreement for that 10 million pound compensation fee. That won't be easy, because I can imagine Leicester City wouldn't have been that happy to negotiate with us. Let's keep things real. But again, if Igbali wants you, Igbali will get you. And I guess I have to end this first point of the video by discussing the level of ambitions Maresk was showing. Is he seeing something in this school that we aren't seeing? Are we as a fan base that's maybe a bit too cynical? Have you been hurt by the past? Past ambitions blowing up in our faces. On paper, should this team, should this squad be ready to fight for a Premier League title? Because I feel like the level of excellency that you are demanding, I think that is such a high level that I'm not too sure this squad can achieve that right now. Because to win the Premier League, you must get at least, at least... 90 points minimum based on Man City dominating and during this league like a farmer's league, yeah? Are we good enough to get 90 points? But dropping maybe three, four losses max, maybe five max if you're lucky. But that means then you have to draw even less games. And we do know that we have the Achilles heel when it comes to breaking down teams that park the bus. Is this too much? Should we not be targeting a high league position, guaranteeing Champions League football, and then the following season, when your Kendrys and your Estevan Williams come, when the team has a year working under Maresca, getting used to him, building that trust, improving in the style of football, then we go for the big league. I don't know. I don't know. Let's see what happens. But one thing we do know is that Maresca, would I necessarily say he's like a philosophy manager? I'm not too sure because I personally get a lot of these similarities between him and a Thomas Tuchel in the sense that these are strategists. These are the type of managers that will look to put out systems and teams, they will alternate how players are used, how the strategy is played out, the tactics for the day, depending on the opposition they're playing against and find the best strategies for the players at his disposal. And I say, reminds me of Tuchel because when Tuchel first came, I think a lot of us felt like, you know, this was his grand philosophy, which he imparted, no. It was more of him finding the best possible system to accommodate the players he had to get us to compete instantly if you guys like the sound of that if you guys miss Tuchel I think he might be moved a little bit then by Enzo Maresca but then equally Maresca but then equally Tuchel had a lot of 
experience at bigger clubs that could really help him in his pursuit of achieving his ambition. Yes, he's a new manager, but it seems like he's really backing himself, backing his vision, backing his ideas, and seems to have the confidence around that. I guess we wait and see, but if you're asking me are we winning the title next season, I don't think so, but I'm here to be surprised. I'm here to be shocked. Who knows if finally things will align in our favour? What if injuries happen to rivals for once? What if the players really do just play even better in this type of football? Only time will tell. But I feel like when you're dropping bars like this, now all of our expectation levels naturally are going to rise. And we have to really see what goes down this preseason. So share your thoughts and opinions. Let us know how you really feel. But we continue to discuss shocking reports because every story today is a massive shocker. And one of the big claims we are now learning is that Enzo Maresca sees Robert Sanchez as his number one. Now, I know a lot of you guys right now might be turning this video off. You're scratching your heads in disbelief. You're rewinding what I'm saying to make sure that you heard me right. Robert Sanchez as number one because listen, I know some of you guys weren't too happy in the comment sections whenever I use Robert Sanchez in these predicted lineup videos. But I'm not doing that because I'm secretly running the Robert Sanchez fan club. I'm doing that because I always like to think what is a manager realistically going to do when he comes here. And there has to be a sense of realism behind our business because we don't have Champions League football. We're not going to splash half a billy signing great top players. There are going to be some surprises that we don't expect. And we also have to see a manager that can utilize what is already at his disposal. So I guess for now, this shuts down all the rumors of us looking towards new goalkeepers, especially now that Maresca has stated Sanchez is his number one. Now, it's interesting because De Zerbi had criticisms of Sanchez's ball playing from the back because Sanchez was finding it quite hard to transition to play more of a short passing game where he couldn't express his passing range and then they had a falling out. But then he signs for us and I think that was based on one of the recommendations of him working under his former goalkeeping coach, Ben Roberts, who today was announced as our head of global goalkeeping. He has big faith in Sanchez and it seems that like Maresca is ready to work with him too. Now, is this a massive mistake we're making or is this something we have to bite the bullet to and accept the reality that we won't be spending millions and millions and millions like that this summer? Time will tell. But as I've said, I understand the frustration with Sanchez. I'm not saying that I'm immune to it or that I don't get it, but I've always tried to find more of a balance point with him. I think like a level of grace should be afforded his way because he missed like 27 games last season. I think he only played like 40% of games and I remember him starting the season, he was getting kind of decent recognition from the fan base. Now, I'm not saying that he was immune to criticism because he definitely was, bear with me, but during that time, Sanchez showed that he was incredibly reliable with his claims. Personally, I think the guy is world class at claiming crosses. The balls literally glued to his hands and He's really impressed me by the security he's brought to our team with that ability to claim catches. That's a big thing. From set pieces, he's big. He's a massive unit. He's 6'6". Six, six. He has that domination in his game. But one of the weaknesses in his game, though, has always been the mental part, concentration. And I do feel like at times he makes a stoppy error because maybe he's pondering his decisions too much or he's not being assertive enough or he's not trusting his technique at the time he should be doing that. Is that something the rest can coach out of him? Can Sanchez show that he can accommodate playing more of a short passing game out from the back? Which, listen, if he wants to be here and play for us, we'll have to accept that because he ain't that Brighton now. He's at Chelsea Football Club, time will tell. And as I'm saying, should he be afforded a level of grace knowing that he was out injured so much? And listen, he did make some mistakes before at the start of the season, but let's not forget big games against Bournemouth, Everton, you know, United. I thought he was good against Man City as well. Yes, he had that big mistake against Arsenal. That's probably one of his biggest mistakes so far. But I think most of his games he was remembered for was when he was coming back from injury, but constantly breaking down again. And he, he quite clearly just was not ready to come back to first team duties. And I think that he's got a bit of an unfair rep. Personally, if Maresca's backing him, what can I do? My number one was Diogo Costa. I think this is a world-class keeper, similar to like what City did when they signed Edison. What Liverpool did when they signed Allison. They're the type of goalkeepers that can really transform your defence. And it's a bit of a shame, firstly, that 
we might not be pursuing this move anymore. But if Maresca feels like we can win the title with Robert Sanchez at the back, maybe there is something in his game because the guy is not completely awful. And listen, we've seen crap goalkeepers. We've seen Kepa. We've seen others. And Sanchez hasn't been dropping stinkers like those guys were doing on a regular basis. And I still seem to remember Kepa had a degree of faith and patience from the fan base for some reason. So let's see what happens here. But at the moment, Robert Sanchez is set to be number one and... As I've been saying in videos, it makes sense to me because if Mareska will use what he has at his disposal, Sanchez is just better on the ball than Jorge Petrovic. This is a fact. The stats show it. And I have to prove that point. But my friends, share your thoughts and opinions. Let's move on. And we discuss shock story number three because it's been revealed by Goal.com Brazil. And listen, when they report something, Brazilian football players believe it as facts because they announce that we have made short contact alongside Tottenham over the availability of Rodrigo Muniz. Now, last season, he ended 2024 as one of the most informed Premier League strikers. We know that he had that incredible uh, consecutive goal streak, some sensational goals there, but he scored nine goals. I got one assist in the last 16 games. And I think he got like 10 goals and one assist over 31 games that season, right? Munis at the moment is represented by CAA base agency. And we've signed a lot of players there. Guys like Robert Sanchez, Ben Chilwell being the main current examples. But it's kind of crazy because last year when he came back from loan from uh, Middlesbrough, Fulham would have accepted bids of around 8 million euros from Brazilian clubs showing interest and in re-signing him to bring him back. At the moment, Goal.com Brazil report that they would want between 30 to 40 million euros to sell him this summer. I guess it makes sense because Munoz currently has two years left on his deal. I guess the question you're all thinking of is Nini. When you're telling me that we've potentially ended interest in Victor Osman due to the prices, you're telling me that Enzo Maresca wants to win the Premier League title. You're telling me that Robert Sanchez will be the number one keeper. Now you're telling me that we're set to sign a mid-table club striker and we think that will be enough for us to get 90 points against Man City and others? I told you, I told you to brace yourself today because you might have been shot by some of these stories. But um, is there something else to this? You guys know me. I like to just talk about all sides of the conversation. You know, I like to do this. And I feel like maybe... Is there a conversation with Muniz? Because if there's one thing that he did demonstrate, he showed that he was one of the most promising back-to-goal strikers in the Premier League last season. The stats in FB Ref reflect this too. He's ranking in the 90th percentiles for many key stats you're looking towards. He's ranking very high in many interesting parts and aspects of his game. Let's discuss some of them. 90th percentile for touches in the books. You're looking at things like small details, like 78th percentile for interceptions, but then he's in the 99th percentile for passes blocked. So off the ball, he presses, but he knows how to position himself to close off passing angles. That's not bad, right? He ranks 94th and 93rd percentiles for short creating actions. He ranks 88th percentiles for long passes with 75% pass completion rate. And that tells you this is a guy that can play back to goal and link up the wide men. If you're going to have pace in behind that like Maresca system is shown, can you find them? Can you play them in? Munoz can do this. He ranks 94th percentile for short totals, getting around four per game, which is quite impressive considering the role he's playing. And his game's about backing into the defender. Even though he's 178 centimeters, like less than six foot, he's stocky, he's strong, he's powerful. When he gets his body in front of his man, most times that ball is his. His aerial game is strong. 89th percentile, he wins a lot of aerial duels. He can spin the defender. He can roll them. He can link up. He can find runners in behinds. And he shows that he's got a bit of a predatory streak in his game. With this announcement of this news, are we looking to do something similar we did last summer where we signed again, one young unsung striker who showed incredible promise at the end of the season? That was Nico Jackson. Are we doing the same thing here with Rodrigo Muniz who's showing that in the Premier League, this guy can not only survive, but he can thrive. He's made big strides in his development. 
He's ending the season incredibly strong and he's showing at 23 years old that's available for a good fee. I think he earns like 7,500 a week. He earns absolutely nothing and he's showing that statistically as he gets better, as he improves, he could be someone that becomes one of the leading deep lying forwards. And remember, Maresca ideally would like to have a forward like this. A rumour that came out today suggested that he told the club to end interest in Victor Simin because he wants more of a back to goal striker. Now this was claims from Italy. I don't personally believe that if you're telling me Victor can't drop deep and link play and back into defenders, you're telling me you've never seen him in your life. And realistically, I think it's more realistic for Maresca to not want Osman. So the funds can be spread on signing other players in other positions. That's how I see it. And I've always had this argument for a while that if you don't sign Victor, essentially you want to spread your goals out across the team. And instead of investing big on a strike like that, what if you use that money instead to sign a big name attacking player like an Elise? I'll discuss Elise quite soon later this week. Don't you worry about that. But that's the new surrounding Rodrigo Minas. How are you guys feeling about this, man? Let us know below. And for the final shock story, or I guess it's not that surprising, but obviously it seems like this is set to be Amari Hutchinson's final season with us. I think he's barely even played for us, to be honest with you. And as we are learning, we won't accept any loan offers for him. If a club wants him, they must sign him on a permanent deal. Now, Feyenoord, Ajax, Stuttgart, Ipswich, I mean, and tons of other unannounced clubs from Europe and the Premier League are really following Amari Hutchinson because he ended the season with Ipswich last season incredibly well. He kind of single-handedly was rising them up the table and his ability to like drift between the lines, play down both flanks and that match-winning ability, goal-scoring ability, actions that lead towards productivity. At his age, he's shown that he's a very promising, exciting player, but with us set to sign Esteval William, with the other attacking players we have with Kendry Pires coming in, there was realistically no use for an Amari Hutchinson. And if anything, this is pure evidence now and the first signs of what this project has always been about. When we're signing a lot of these talented type of players, it was a bargain to sign Hutchinson for the fee we did. We knew that most of them wouldn't be becoming first team players. But if they were successful, these are players you can flip. You can flip for big money and you're then using that money to go back into the club books so you can spend on signing maybe better players or other players in positions that you actually need. I think we bought Hutchinson for like, was it 3 million or less? I can't remember top of my head. Now, if I remember, and I might be wrong top of my head, I'm sorry, but I think we signed Hutchinson for like under 3 million from Arsenal, but there was a sell-on clause included in that deal. So hence why we're asking for big money because Arsenal make a few million from this. But the fact that you're flipping a player in the space of two years for an eight-figure fee, that isn't bad business and that is the type of business that I'm expecting us to constantly pull off every single summer now. That's how we're doing things. I think Kasade might be an option like that. Angelo Gabriel could be that option. We're going to see players who do get flipped and moved on and that's going to help us fund other moves I guess for your Munizes and other players like this. I know I'm being too cynical but uh, yeah Amari Hutchinson I hope he has a great career is probably best for him. I think that's one of the reasons why he signed for us because he felt like we would manage his career better. And at the moment, if he was to get sold, he could be going and playing Champions League football or European football for a big club at 21 years old. I think that sets his future up perfectly for years to come, right? Friends, that's all the stories today. I'm going to try and do a live stream later on because I feel like it's time for you guys to share your thoughts with me so we can have these discussions, right? So... Make sure you guys pay attention on the community page, but I'm going to need some time first because after this, I need to go to the gym. I need to eat. So it might be around the evening time. So my friends, thank you for watching. I'm in the FC. This is Blue Lines TV. See you all later. Cool.